Greetings, fellow humans, and welcome to Sam and Max Hit the Books. I'm Max. I'm Sam. And we've got some comics to review for you this week. These are the books that came out on the 19th of June in the year of our Lord, 2019. Uh, Sam, old buddy, old pal, uh, what's the first book you want to talk about? All right, we got the newest issue of Tom King's Batman, uh, number 73. Dead Man Walking. Art by uh, Michael Jannon. And, uh, yeah, so this is a road through the desert, uh, Batman and his pa. <coughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's a little bit weird. It's a little weird. Okay, one, remember <laughs> last issue when Bane broke Bruce's back again? Right, yeah, totally. Um, well, that totally doesn't matter. No, it doesn't seem to. Uh, he broke his, uh, and I guess he gave him to Thomas. And then Thomas uh, Who was a doctor, out, right? When uh, mended him, him up a little bit and put put him on a horse, and now they're now they're going through the desert. Took him out into the desert. Took him out into the desert because they're <laughs> looking for the na- the Nain pit. It's a better Lazarus pit, bro. Did you hear about them Nain pits? <laughs> That's better than a Lazarus pit. Better than a Lazarus can, pit? Why would anybody ever go to the Lazarus pit? To uh, come back to life, man. That's what Rache does. But why would you need it if you got a, a, a this pit? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. Right. Like, why wouldn't Rache be using that pit? Right, exactly. You don't need that Lazarus pit. Don't you come out, uh, come back uh, insane from the... If it's better than the Lazarus pit, I assume you don't come out back uh, insane. Right, and I don't think the Lazarus pit can bring you back if you're like a desiccated corpse. Like, so I don't think that if they tossed, like, Martha's bones in, from this coffin into the Lazarus pit, I don't think right. anything would come out. No, it won't. They won't reconstitute you. Right. I don't think so. But I don't know. Who knows? In Tom King's happy Batman world, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, he invented a new one. Then he's decided. Right. <laughs> we're, we're seeing it. Right. You need something else. Maybe this one will be sentient. That'll be fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was an all right issue, you know. Uh, Thomas is singing... The okay. old song of the entire time. That was the thing that pissed me off the most. That was the most Tom King-ish thing of the issue. Was like he's got a he ha- feels like he has to squeeze something in, right? And then you you notice the fact that you're reading the same bubbles, right. again and again, and that's very annoying. And it makes you. It's interesting because the one time. Like, what was the last time we pretty much enjoyed a Tom King comic? I would, the, the Batman run. I would say it was the Roadrunner issue. And, you know, what was the thing about uh, that issue? Right. It was that uh, there weren't speech bubbles of any kind across a bunch of the art. He let the art speak for itself. And Mikkel Janin yeah. is a good enough artist. Like, not my favorite. It's all sort of static. Well, it is but a little monotone. The coloring makes it a little bit monotone. Yeah, and then, it's yeah, not the, it's... Not the art, totally. But, yeah, for the me, it was... The fact that it's, you know, I'm sick enough of seeing a uh, beige filter, a uh, sepia <laughs> tone in movies. I, I don't need that in comics, In comics. Too. So true. And, like, it, this is one of those things where it's like, oh, I guess I kind of want to know what happens next, but this is not compelling. <laughs> no. Like, that didn't go anywhere. It's a, it's a walk through the desert. It's a walk through the desert with, with a little fighting. A little fighting, yeah. There were some ninjas. Right, with a new plot point that is like all seems very disconnected from the other plot points. Like if this is all just a plan for Thomas Wayne to make it so Bruce doesn't want to be Batman anymore, so that he can be Batman or whatever his end game is. Well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's weird. Not compelling. Nah, nah. Uh, still, I would I'd give it a three because yeah, the the line art is awesome. I'm going to give it a two. I, I, I didn't enjoy it. Did not enjoy it. You go to the desert and you don't have them fight the ten-eyed men? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the first issue of the IDW age of Usaki Ojimbo. Um, this is a new publisher, so we're getting a brand spanking new number one, new plot line, and for the first time ever, all in color. Usagi right. Monthly's uh, typically been black and white. I know they've colored some mm-hmm. later, um, like the way they do with manga, but the, the IDW series, I guess, is going to be all color. Huh. And let me tell you, Stan Sakai, still, to this day, has never written or drawn a bad issue of Usagi Ojebo, <laughs> because this was very good. Yeah, it was good. It it's never tries to be more than it is. That's one of the keys, because... 
there's nothing overly like oh my god like this particular aspect of the song is so amazing it just all flows together so mm. solidly and it feels so very japanese history right. as it's trying to he's so good yeah, about that's portraying the, that's the real thing about it the manners yeah the manners everybody's uh, apologizing and thanking each other all the time while talking about uh, uh you know using that using the language Given the meaning. Right, and we're even getting one of those classic little, uh, you know, ooh, a story. Isn't a story magical? Things that uh, stories love to do when, <laughs> when we, we see our puppet show. And we get a little history of the way that these uh, complex puppet shows worked in uh, the feudal era. Yeah, of right. Japan. And, uh, man, Usagi, what a cool character. He just, what a, what a, what a cool guy. Yeah, no, he's mean, super chill. He's the <laughs> protagonist. <laughs> Yeah, gonna, gonna fight some evil. There we got That's a little easier for. We at the beginning we get some stuff with the demon hunter, and uh, he fights a demon to his last breath. He's got some magic, and but then it, he, he kills the demon, gets a message from someone yeah. that someone. <laughs> uh, there's more demons to fight, and then we're gonna get it looks like some stuff with some uh, maybe some haunted puppets. That's exactly what it looks like. Uh, I'm down for some haunted puppets and some Usagi Jimbo. Yeah, no, it's uh. It's, it's nice. It's it's just it's just solid, right? It's it's just one good unit of well told, well drawn comics with funny little animal characters being right. very serious about things. Yeah, in the feudal era, I mean, that that's awesome. Everybody loves that era. <laughs> um, I gotta give it an eight. That's that's I, I love Usagi. I give it I give it a seven. Usagi looks kind of short to me on the cover. <laughs> He doesn't normally wear all this armor. It's the right. shoulders. Right. Yeah. It's probably the armor, but it, it looks like a, a little mini Usagi. <laughs> That's not related to your rating. You're just mentioning that. No, I, yeah, I'm just mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we got the issue 26 of Justice League, uh, James Tiny in the fourth, and... Uh, George Fernandez? No, this is, is this Leandro? Javier Fernandez. Javier. Yes, this yes. Is a, this Javier is the B Fernandez. Team. This is the B team that uh, should get the best six man in the NBA award this year because every time Tiny writes an issue, it's always like a catch up issue. It's always like a here's where we are, here's where we are going. We're not going to change anything really in this issue. But then he's going to fucking set it at the House of Heroes and they're going to be calling all of the. Uh, multiversity justice leagues from across reality, including my man, my boy, Captain Carrot. Right. <clears throat> Which is awesome. Love, love yeah. some Captain Carrot. That's all going on. <laughs> we got wonderful splash pages of just lots of heroes from uh, various multiverses. So, you know, you'll see a few Batmans in there and everything. I love uh, how Superman is like, thank you for coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> And, you know, the implication that bad stuff is happening to every universe related to the Source Wall. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's nice that nobody's uh, blaming them. <laughs> and that we know of. In their universe. Yeah. Uh, Batman Beyond uh, Batman uh, shows up a little bit. Uh, I always like to see him. I always think that's funny. That's two weeks of Batman Beyond in a row. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Yeah, pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just a little bit. And, uh, yeah, they go over the plan. World Fortress there, and he's a uh, he's big guy yeah, for they, everybody to see. Yeah, he's the one thing they have that none of the other universes have. Right, we, we brought the World Fortress with us today. Yeah, yeah it's, very, a nice moment. it's very interesting. I noticed, uh, I, when I was reading this issue, I realized that Snyder and Tiny kind of are uh, kind of lifting a little bit from Jonathan Hickman's Avengers run, because there was this whole arc... Uh, where this dude, ex Nilo, who shows up and he's like a planet maker and he's trying to modify Earth into a giant living organism so that it will be strong enough to face the coming defeat that's happening because the multiverse is breaking down. And then right. after they beat him, the Avengers get ex Nilo on their side. And it's like, man, World Forger, World Forger's ex Nilo. This is the same plot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. That's well, why I liked totally. it so much last <laughs> issue when they brought World Forger to their team. Right, exactly. Which uh, is awesome. Also, the Terrifics were there. Also very cool. The Terrifics were there. I love seeing the Terrifics. They're definitely always tied into this uh, multiverse shit. You got uh, the Metal Man. I mean, yeah, it's very, yeah. it's funny because the cover is like, 
the death of Starman, and then in the issue, there's like a page where it's like, yeah, Starman, he's he's still a little sick, but right, <laughs> he and Jaro are working together to try and do stuff, which is uh, just hilarious. Uh, I'd give it a seven. Yeah, I think seven's right. Uh, consistently, the tiny issues of Justice League. Right, I want tiny and uh, does great on everything. It's like Snyder keeps like. Ah, this cool thing out here. Oh man, and this, oh, this thing, and a tiny guy who's like, okay, bring it all back. Right, bring it all back. Let's summarize real quick. <laughs> all right. So uh, next up, uh, we're going to talk about issue six of Guardians of the Galaxy by Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw. Um, this oh, ends yeah. the arc, the first arc. Of, right, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting Thanos to get uh, wrapped up. Right, they just they, they tied that up and subverted our ex- ex- expectations. He really did, because you really think Thanos is coming back. And right, and they're going to make a big deal about Thanos for a long time. Right. No, no, they, uh, they, they didn't even finish the Thanos transfer, but guess what that means? <laughs> what happens, I guess, when Thanos only partially re-inhabits his body? <laughs> As he, he comes to life. And he says, uh, uh, Thanos, Thanos <laughs> he's, oh man, yeah, and then you think to yourself, okay, well this is an interesting status quo for Thanos, he can be dumb now, I guess, <laughs> like, what if Hulk was a villain and could blow up a planet, like, easily, right, but no, no, he's just gonna be at the center of a black hole now. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there he goes. Um, thanks primarily to our boy, Beta Ray Bill. He right, continues he to be awesome. the MVP of the he's stealth MVP in uh, Silver Surfer last week. Yeah, uh, just bringing Lockjaw to Guardians of the Galaxy. His hammer is doing like seventy percent of the work happening on page in any given moment. Right, it's, everybody's just like, okay, now now's the time. Bill, do the thing, and he throws the hammer. <laughs> he's he's cool horse Thor. Yes. Like I, yeah, we all even know. acts like cool horse Thor. Right, and the best like Thor hasn't even been as Thor-ish of late as Beta Ray Bill has been Thor-ish. God, that's so true, and <laughs> it, it makes me sad. There's so much Thor stuff in Thor. Beta Ray Bill can just be the trappings of Thor without all this modern continuity attached to him. Right, the other people who are Thor, but they're not Thor anymore, but they kind of are. Right. And Thor, uh, he's old man, he's more like Odin now, or then you're getting fat Thor. I mean, <laughs> what happened? We got Thor Ragnarok, and it was awesome, and then Thor since then has been disappointing. And even that Thor is weird, because it's like buzz cut cool Thor with swords, like, <laughs> yeah. like it's far, very far away from the trappings of Thor. Yeah, that's um, true. I think that it is a, this is also a seven for me. <clears throat> yeah, I'd give it a seven. Cool. And uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, the fourth issue of Little Bird, uh, <clears throat> Darcy Van Polgeest. And Ian Bertram uh, worked on this issue. Yeah, Ian Bertram, the noodle man. Yeah, and it is very noodly. As you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit about a spider uh, and the baby it laying eggs, and then it's babies eating the, the mother's <laughs> corpse at the beginning. Always love seeing that. The most heavy handed piece of like literary symbolism I've seen in a long time when it's like, ooh, the baby spider eating the mother's spider. I can't wait to see exactly how this plays out right, as no, the metal says, plot. We've all <laughs> We've all seen it. <laughs> we've all heard that before. But uh, it's always creepy because it's about spiders. Yeah, I was confused at first because I didn't realize we were seeing flashback. Right, because she got uh, captured. And uh, right. yeah, that, that happened before because she came running around in the bad guy's base. Right, right. Got caught. Uh, that's our summary from last time. But uh, I, I didn't realize, uh, or I had forgotten, uh, that her and that kid are brothers. Right, because the, she's the, the, like the pre-evil Pope priest dude is her dad, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, not, uh, not, not the axe. <laughs> it's her grandfather on her mother's side. Right, that's what it was. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the yeah. axe, that's the one thing that this issue is lacking that the first three issues had. Was the fucking axe right? And I, I am hoping that the somehow axe is not as dead as 
he most definitely uh, would appear to be. I mean, is that what we're seeing when the pirate guy in the eye patch is crawling towards that uh, capsule thing? Was that his thing from when he showed up? But like, I, I feel like we pirate might be right. Guy. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know what, what get, you're talking about with pirate guy was, or a bounty hunter guy, the guy who turned them in last issue. Oh yeah, this guy. Right? Oh right, at the end here, and he, he's walked t- towards that thing that he hid. And, right, because uh, he and the axe were friends. Right. Okay, yeah, you could have something on something there. Because, uh, yeah, he, he definitely probably isn't as uh, bad a guy. Well, they didn't make him out to be a real bad guy. Right. He's Lando Calrissian. <laughs> right, right, exactly. We, we definitely saw him <laughs> feeling bad about turning him in last issue. Right. <laughs> Especially after his crew all got shot. Oh, yeah. But then our ending, which is very interesting, because I imagine there was a temptation to make it a twist what happens when what happens is the kind of thing that like normally would be a twist but they make it very obvious what's happening when the little boy switches them in the jail cell and he gets taken out to be killed and sacrificed instead of the girl right <clears throat> Which, yeah uh, yeah that's it that's a yeah because i was trying to figure out why is it showing the guard pulling the razor blade out i couldn't figure it out and then i'm like oh wait was she always bald no, no. He, oh, that's they shaved both looked, their heads and then they switched. Right. So the the fucking the kid sacrificed himself and had his dad kill him. Right, that's what happened. Right. No, you're definitely <laughs> right. <laughs> just had like, yeah, yeah I burned yeah, him. Yeah, like, my God, you're right. There was a twist there that I wasn't paying attention for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what I was wondering because to me it was like, oh my God, this is definitely what's happening. It's not even a twist. No, I mean, but, why wouldn't they do that? That's perfect. Yeah, exactly. So, very good. Very good. One more issue to go. Yeah. Man. All right, yeah. I give it, I give it a seven. Yeah. No, I gotta give it an eight. All right. I, I really enjoyed it, and the Ian Bertram art continues to, to be standout. This is the kind of thing that, That's uh, true. that you want to get in an mm-hmm. oversize. I mean, you want to see some good art uh, after the last page of the comic there's that uh, concept or uh, whatever poster the first one right oh there. yeah the jp uh, kim one yeah yeah that is uh, I, I really enjoyed that as well yeah it's <laughs> incredible <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it uh, it's a completely different art style and yet it manages to capture the essence of the noodly worminess oh yeah there's there's worms all over it but also uh you know dots and uh, just, just overall poppy colors which uh, is always great for gruesome artwork. Yeah, just, I miss... Uh, the pop color palette. I miss comics doing, like, a, just a real solid pinup gallery. You know, it, why does it all have to be story art? You know, get some <laughs> cool artists to do, you know, you don't have to have them all be a different cover you have to buy, Marvel. That's but, true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the big release for the week, literally, is issue one of the DC Black Label Special Limited Series, Superman, Year One, by Frank Miller and John Romita Jr. Very glad that I managed to score the Frank Miller cover, because my major problem with this comic is that John Romita Jr. is drawing it, and I am not a fan of his current art style. Let me tell you. Uh, yes, the, co- the art style in that is in this comic. I know what you mean. Uh, my first gripe is uh, that uh, baby, uh, baby can't... Uh-huh. Never comes off as little baby. Uh, That's the little, thing, little, right? Little baby uh, can. It's very interesting to me because I've been rereading the Dune books lately, and Clark Kalel in this reminds me very much of the way that uh, Leto Atreides and his sister are because they're born with full awareness. They're born with all the knowledge and memories of adults. Right. It definitely seemed that way because, yeah, uh, both the artwork and uh, the word boxes were leading it to be like, oh, this is a fully cognition, like probably around six or seven year old based on the art, but also... He's just on, born. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it never comes off as just born. Based on the dialogue or and, the art. Well, and then the other weird <laughs> change that's made is that Baby Clark appears to have some form of, like, passive defensive telepathy that latently convinces Jonathan Kent and his wife to take him in and shelter him rather than, like, report it to the authorities or anything. I didn't read it as telepathy. I just read it as, you know, 
I, I, I'm smart, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to baby up. Except, John Kent feels something probe inside his skull. A gentle warmth makes him feel like his brain is floating. The boy coos, pleased. This is not a hostel. Let him take you to your new home. Let him think this is all his idea. Right, yeah, no, I That's, read the let him think that this is all his idea thing, and I went, ah, that, that, uh, you know, I, I passed that off, waved that away, it was, uh, nah. Maybe, but then, <laughs> when he's introduced to Martha, and she almost seems hypnotized by him, like his eyes, his eyes have seen worlds and wonders. Uh, everybody gets hypnotized like baby with crazy eyes. No, I'm telling you, man, like, this was, a, for this was Frank Miller legitimately putting, like, a weird passive telepathy in. I'm telling you. Yeah, what if, what if Superman were to develop uh, active telepathy with those he's supposed to? What if Superman has always had passive telepathy making people like him and didn't realize it? That would be interesting, too. Wouldn't that be creepy? That would be if creepy. The only reason that people like Superman is because he gives out a like me pulse. I, I doubt it's the only reason. Right. The only. <laughs> um, this was such a weird, interesting comic in the way that only Frank Miller can write because it's so confusing trying to figure out where he's trying to go, what he's trying to say, right. like why and he's, which like, direction uh, in any argument uh, he's coming from. Exactly. What is he actually positing? And I think it's it's challenging, but I think it's a good look at the way that we've seen uh, of like having a Superboy grow up like how would this person think and how would they be able to avoid the temptations of using all that power how would they grow up to really respect their power even as a young kid who technically shouldn't be able to like think in terms of the you know long-term effects and ramifications and plots and everything and oh, right. part of his solution i guess is well he's a genius since he was born <laughs> right <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah he, he knows everything he's taking advice not only from from Daddy Kent, but also from uh, his father's voice recordings from the space pod as he journeyed through space. And I think that there was also sort of a push to explain why Superman would both be this person who should be the ultimate pacifist, if he's given like the upbringing we've normally seen him be given, but is also the kind of person who's totally willing to knock a thug out and like give them an injury to make them rethink their... Uh, course in life, which oh, yeah. he is willing to do, like not in the way Batman is, right? But. And it did seem like they weren't going to go in that direction when he started injuring a few people, and it didn't make the problem better, right? But and so it is interesting. <laughs> but the solution after that was like injure him a little worse, yeah, injure him a little more <laughs> in a slightly scarier way, yeah. Which I, I, I found that to be uh, pretty funny. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's a very interesting thing. I'm very curious to see where things are going to go. Yeah, I um, like that young, uh, young Kent likes uh, Doc Savage. That was the best, right? When it's like actually seeing it, like his Frank remembers. He's going to pull out the origins. He's like, oh, I should have Clark be inspired by Doc Savage since Superman was inspired by Doc Savage. Right. No, like, great. No, I, I showed great. that to Steve at work, and yeah, he was loving it. But... <laughs> Yeah, that's a, it was a pretty, it was an interesting, risky issue. I think it's, I think it takes some guts to try to write a Superman this different from what we're used to. Mm, definitely. It, I am curious to find out if we'll officially, like, get word of, of if this is supposed to be the Superman from the Dark Knight universe, as he's appeared in, like, the Dark Knight Returns and stuff. Interesting. Because since that since Frank Miller Superman has always been presented as a little bit more of a patriot. Like, a little bit more of a, I'm going to help the U.S. government with their things, especially right. in the original Dark Knight Returns, where he's practically the main villain. <laughs> um, so this does, to me, seem like it's edging in that direction of a Superman who would enlist in the Navy is a Superman who could potentially go up to be that slightly more American patriot Superman. I like that. <clears throat> Yeah. I am very curious to see where that goes in the next issue. I wonder if that's going to be like the whole next issue <laughs> is his right. experience in the Navy. Right, in the Navy. That's an uh, interesting place for him to go. Very interesting and different. The idea of putting Superman in the armed forces at all is like weird. Right, right. you wouldn't think of that. Yeah, but <laughs> man, I, I, I mean, really... Boy Scouts, sure. <laughs> very true. Boy, and it's interesting that we didn't see him as a scout at all in this right. because he's even called Boy Scout all the time. Of course. People. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I guess they're nice. going to call him lieutenant now. <laughs> right. <laughs> be, wouldn't it be great if he became a captain? Oh, man. Captain <laughs> Superman. 
Um, I really enjoyed this. I'm really looking forward to where it's going to go. I, I normally I don't love John Romita's art, but it didn't yeah. offend me as much as it could have. It, he told the story. His faces are a little weird, but but it told the story. True. Um, I'm going to give this one a seven. Mm. All right. I'll give it an eight. Wow. All right. I, I was surprised by that from our conversation. Yeah, no, no, I still thought it was great, as, as far as Superman goes. It's great, right? Uh, Frank, man, he just writes differently. He does write differently. Uh, there were even some terms uh, in this uh, book that I read, and, uh, uh, you, you know, you could get a lot of trouble for saying things like, uh, the grass here still smells the same as it did back then when I was a kid. You know, things <laughs> like that. I noticed two things in here that would uh, allude to climate change. I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, normally when I read this word, I'm about to read something that's, that I'm going to disprove of. <laughs> But, but then I didn't. It. Yeah, he's just doing it because people really say shit like that. Right, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's how people also talked and, booked and acted back then. Exactly. <clears throat> you know, the, all of the characterizations felt very good. Even as weird as Clark himself is. Like, I liked Martha. I liked <clears throat> Jonathan Kent being a little bit more of a, like, yeah, I'm going to support your mother. You should be a pacifist. But, you know, if that bully got hurt, I'm not going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. <laughs> Superman, he, he actually remind, reminded me a little bit of Dash. <laughs> Dash? From The Incredibles. Yeah, I could see you know, that. They don't let play sports because, of course, well, I mean, they eventually do let him play sports. Yeah. yeah. He goes for track. And, of course, he could win, but he has to get in second because he's hiding who he is. And it's like, let's, let's do that, but with... with Grand old Superman. This it did kind of imply that it, it should be very easy for anybody from Smallville from that time to guess that he's Superman later in life. Oh, definitely. Right, like, <laughs> like that goth kid. I wonder where that's going to go because that came up and then it was never addressed. The goth kid who got mad on the bus when Clark sat next to Lana. Well, obviously he's going to become the. Jo- oh, right, no, that's Batman. He fights the Joker. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Exactly, though. <laughs> it's like, he's also in, in, the, in the Navy. Like, right. All right, well, that is going to do it for us for the week. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And uh, we will be back next week with even more comic reviews. I've never understood the jibe, uh, go slap an egg. <laughs>